Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Welcome back. Today is part three, and we're talking about how to make millions from door knocking. Millions and millions. You know, and it's true, especially if you're door knocking in an area with a really high average sale price. Yeah, that would be a smart thing to do, wouldn't it? <laughs> hey, you know what? We should have had that be one of the points in first. Actually, it was. It was your first point. Yes, that's right. From, Choose wisely. From two days ago. Yeah, so if you're listening or wanting to hear the first uh, two parts of this series, you obviously can find those over on YouTube, and you can find them on uh, Stitch, you know, on our uh, podcast, uh, Stitcher, uh, iTunes, every place you might possibly imagine um, where you can listen to a podcast. The first two shows, along with, by the way, thousands of other podcasts are waiting for you. Our YouTube channel is a continuation of our podcast. And thank you for continuing to make our podcast the number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. So Julie, before we get to point number nine, um, I had an epiphany. And the epiphany is simply, there's a lot of agents out there right now that are going to be looking for um, a new broker, frankly. Yes. Because their year hasn't gone the way I had hoped it would go. They're realizing their broker is not able to, frankly, support them during this changing market. There are a lot of people that are looking for a new direction, and they're looking to attach themselves to something that's going to help reinforce their goals for this you know, continuation of this changing market with inflation and all the rest of it. Guys, by the way, in the news cycle, there's going to be good news, there's going to be bad news, but the cycle that we're in with regards to inflation is not a short-term cycle. There is no zero inflation. Inflation at, at its current level is going to go up and it's going to go down over the, at least the next 12 months. So understand that we are in a long-term cycle and that's just fine because you can learn how to thrive in this market. The market really ultimately doesn't matter that much, provided you have the skills to actually know what to do. And so there are a lot of agents that are looking for new brokers. So I would propose to you mm-hmm. that we do a series, maybe two or three days, on choosing a broker. We've done that in the past, sure. but the reality of it is is that w- the rules to choose a broker um, are different in a changing market. Because totally one, agree. one of the big things you have to legitimately be concerned about most brokers, listeners, this will shock you, but it's true, are operating on, in the best of times, 2 or 3% net margins. I want you to think about that. So all the commissions that come into your brokerage, let's say your brokerage, I'll just keep the numbers simple and small, relatively speaking. Let's say the brokerage earns a million dollars. That's not simple nor small, but just again, so I can do the math in my head. Then the broker's net from that is going to be no more than 2 or 3%. So they're going to make less than 50 grand off that brokerage earning a million dollars in commissions after all of their expenses and paying agents. Agents commissions being the biggest portion of the, you know, where the revenue is going. That is shocking. Now, if all of a sudden the business slows down, is if cash isn't flowing as much, there's obviously fewer real estate transactions happening right now until the market sorts itself out, which by the way, Julie and I are uh, seeing more reasons to believe there's going to be another real estate boom that's going to last maybe a year that's going to start probably in second quarter of next year. You can mark our words on that because we're seeing an enormous uh, amount of momentum uh, towards, frankly, the interest rate's not going up anymore and be, uh, behind more inventory coming for sale, which will create an unprecedented number of buyers who've been fence sitting. And that includes homes that need, you know, sellers that need to sell before they buy. They're all going to be entering into the market. That's going to create a huge surge in real estate transactions. We think that's going to happen next year. But the moral of the story is many of you are caught in brokers who are, were barely surviving in the best of times and won't be surviving now. That's the reason you're feeling a lack of support because those brokers, rightfully so, are more focused on making sure they personally are going to base, you know, be able to keep their own personal lights on. That's the reason a lot of your brokers are still selling because they're not making any money off the brokerage. So well, if they're, you, they're literally subsidizing the brokerage with their own transactions. And that's a good point. So if you're a broker and you are you know, doing, and I see this happen, Julie and I have talked about this on the show before, we see this happening with brokers, we see this happening with teams, and it's very common and it's become normalized that a broker will, as Julie just said, keep the lights on in the brokerage by chipping in from their own real estate transactions. In other words, they would have made a hell of a lot more money and had a lot less stress had they just stayed agents versus becoming a real estate broker. And on the team side of things, we've seen, really it's very rare that we don't see this, 
where the buyer's agent side of the business is unprofitable, that the seller side, the listing side, which is generally speaking the only side where the profit for the owner or the team leader comes from, that is subsidizing the buyer agent side. So if, for example, if you were to do a profit and loss, not on the overall team transactions, but do one for the seller side, one for the buyer side, you'll see almost always that the buyer side of the, the house, of the buyer side of the business, makes no real profit or not very much profit, or in some cases loses money, and it's being subsidized by the listing side, to which then you ask yourself, why the hell would they be doing the buyer side to begin with? And they'll rationalize it. Well, the buyer side pays for the overhead, the buyer side this, the buyer side that. And look, there's a lot of different ways to, you know, I think compare and contrast the numbers. But the moral of the story is, in a market like this, what you absolutely positively need to be doing is reeling expenses and being very smart. And a lot of that starts with your brokerage. I had a conversation with somebody, actually on the commercial side, mm -hmm. and you know who this is. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about commission splits. And he's a commercial agent, and a lot of commercial agents are on 50-50 forever, and he was as well. So his commission split is his brokerage, and he does very consistently about $30 million a year. And $30 million in commercials, very similar commission-wise to what it is in residential based on what he sells. I know what his numbers were. And when you looked at actually what he paid, he was, pay he was on a 50-50 split until he paid in a half million dollars every year. Think about that. Well, how many? I've had com uh, conversations with residential agents mostly, uh, very rarely do you guys actually really know what you're paying your broker because you'll be really proud of yourselves because you're on a 92, you know, you're uh, on some split where you're, I'm getting 90%, I'm getting 93%, I'm getting 94%, or I have a big secret split with my broker and I'm not allowed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I, and really it's like a 95%. Ooh, you're almost a hundred percent, but you're not remembering that you're paying some sort of annual six or 7% fee on top of that on, on every transaction. So you've never been on a 90% split. So you guys get the point? In a market like this, where there's going to be more um, you know, reasons to be very careful with your money, you've got to start with what you're paying your broker, because aside from taxes, frankly, it's probably your biggest expense. And after that, there's other expenses as well, but really start there. So the broker thing is a real, very critical important. Now, if you're a team leader, if you're a broker, you really need to be drilling down operate under the assumption that things are going to get, I don't know what the word will be, the adjective, tougher, harder, more challenging. All those words I think are true in the next months, if not years. Assume that things aren't going to become more buoyant because they won't. Assume that if you've basically been operating on tiny margins, this is a good time for you to reposition yourself in the marketplace and think about doing something differently. And so, yes, Julie and I are strongly encouraging all of you to consider EXP Realty. That's the reason EXP Realty and all the reasons I've just stated and more is the fastest growing real estate brokerage of its size in the United States. And yes, of course, Julie and I are aligned with EXP Realty. If you want to have a conversation about EXP Realty, we would love to. Just text me directly. And this is my real cell phone number. Don't call text. I'm going to say it again. Don't call text. I will not answer if you call. 99% of the time it's on do not, you know, I won't hear the ring or I'm on a call or something else is going on like I'm doing a podcast. So text 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. Every one of you needs a broker, right? Why not choose a broker that actually is going to be positioned to get you through this real estate uh, challenge and this economic shift that we're experiencing where you come out even better on the other side. You think and don't think this, some of you do think that your best days were behind you. The boom is over. Now we're going to go into the bus period. Not Those things aren't really true because the fact is, is you can have ever increasing levels of success in your business and personal life, provided that you are operating under the assumption that you have to adapt and change. And now is one of those times. So seriously consider moving over to EXP Realty. If you're a new agent, it's perfect. If you're a grizzled veteran agent, it's perfect. If you're a team uh, leader, absolutely consider EXP Realty. And Julie and I would love the opportunity to discuss with uh, you joining us at EXP Realty. Text me directly, 512-758-0206. And just put in the subject line of the text or just text EXP or Let's Talk EXP. And I will personally follow up. No, you will not be delegated. No, it is not an AI response. I get all these things when people text me. I know. It is really me. But yes, I might have some fun with you if you ask if it's really me. I might actually try to tease you <laughs> because I'm telling you now it's really me. But anyway, 512-758-0206. And let's talk EXP Realty. So back to door knocking. We're on part three. If you missed parts one and two, get caught up on this podcast series. So part three, point number nine talking door knocking, dress professionally, but not over formal and smile. You are probably on camera. 
Look confident and approachable, not like a creepy IRS agent. Wear your name not, tag. No, no, come on. You were profiling there. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure not every IRS agent is creepy. But some maybe of, not all. Some of them. them are probably very pleasant. Yeah, but you know, look approachable. Yeah. So wear your name tag <laughs> or a shirt with your company logo. Okay, some kind of thing that makes you very friendly. But do dress professionally. Don't be too casual. Now, again, you got to modify depending on your market. If you're in some sort of beach community and you're showing up looking sure. like a mortician. That's not necessarily <laughs> going to be something that people are going to want to answer the door for. But one of the rules, we talk about this in our book, Harris Rules, is always dress a notch or at least a half notch better than what how everyone else dresses. It does give you an advantage in every condition. If you walk into you know, Starbucks and everyone else is in flip flops and dirty t-shirts and you're wearing a button down shirt and you're, you know, you guys get the point, you're going to immediately look better and subconsciously people are going to see you on a higher plane. We're all just, you know, basic animals and we're respondent to pretty colors and shapes and things like that, you know. Well, and looking like you have your act together. Right. That doesn't mean you have to wear a tie or anything like that. But, you know, to Tim's point, if your market generally runs around in flip-flops, you maybe you wear loafers. If everybody wears muscle shirts, you can wear a polo shirt. It doesn't have to be overly formal. It does show respect to the person and the people that you're hoping to do business with that you've actually made an attempt to, you know, look nice. It just does. That is this, again, a subcon... Look, when you think of somebody who's uh, successful at anything, do you picture them slovenly or do you picture them looking nice? Do you guys get it? When you picture what successful people look like, when you picture yourself looking successful, do you look like you look now? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> judging by what I'm wearing. But the reality of it is, is that you need to look, dress, and act like the person that you want to be. Point number 10. Well, and then you'll have the confidence that goes along with it. Yep. Okay, point number 10. Consider door knocking condos and or townhomes that have exterior doors. Buildings are harder to get into and more regulated with those interior doors. But why would you consider that? Well, they have a higher turnover and are closer together. It's an efficiency thing. They also often have billboards where you can post your market update and your call to action. Often you, you, they're, you mean like in the lobby? Like not, in the lobby, yeah. Not billboards like in... Oh, not like, you know, freeway yeah. billboards. Right. But, you know, like next to the mailboxes, some, a cork board, I should have said. So often there will be investor owners who actually own multiple units. So these contacts can lead to more than one transaction with certain clients. Get to know the president of the homeowners association, et cetera. They know who's behind on dues, who's moving, who's an investor, and so on. So that's simply an efficiency play there to go to those types of townhomes, et cetera. All right. Well, I mean, and they do is, have higher turnover, but it is hard to door knock if you're in, in a rural community. Yeah, it is hard to door knock. If so, if you're, That's true. It, and we do get these questions occasionally, I live in an area where the closest, you know, property is five miles, you know, apart. Well, that's probably not going to be a really good area for door knocking, but it will be a great area for calling. And, and another thing to consider, we don't talk a lot about this on the show uh, today or tomorrow, is the fact that you're some of you live in an area where there's a lot of absentee owners. And so you're going to be knocking on doors where there's a lot of tenants, or you're going to be knocking on doors where there might even be a lot of VRBO uh, tenant type things. In those cases, door knocking in that community, not a smart move. Consider actually making calls to those people in those particular areas. In some cases, letters uh, to absentee owners in particular, depending again on the mix of uh, who your owners are. Or, and move to or focus on an area where there will be a lot of owners answering the door and don't set the, you know, some of you, I think intentionally make it so you have an excuse not to do what you don't want to do and you don't want to do it at the highest level. So you will say, well, in my market, Tim, the houses are five miles apart and everyone's a tenant. Well, you're essentially looking for an excuse to be lazy. So move past that and think, well, maybe 10 miles up the way or five miles up the way is a perfect community where you can actually start doing this type of work. Well, the question would be, well, where is the opportunity, right? So if we look at, for example, where we used to live in Georgetown, Texas, yes, the houses were two to 10 acres apart, not great door knocking, but you drive south 20 minutes and it is great door knocking and there is more turnover and there is more density. So Instead of looking for why you can't do it, look for why you can do it. Point number 11. Here's another example of that. Door knock new construction model homes and connect with the new build sales reps. They know who is already closed but is getting relocated and already has to sell, who is contingent on a home sale. They know what the unsold spec homes are, the bonuses on certain houses, etc. 
So you're out there door knocking anyway. Don't ignore this really important source of business. We have done dedicated podcasts all about new construction we not did. too long ago. Yeah, I mean last yep. week, I think. So definitely listen, to, or maybe the week before. Definitely listen or view if you're on YouTube all the information that we've provided about how to actually um, make it so that new construction home reps are your besties. Point number 12. Point number 12, go door knocking in neighborhoods where you already have past clients. Start by popping by and chatting with them first. They are your ever-present testimonials right there in the community. They can be bird dogs for you and let you know who's moving and when and endorse that you do a great job when people ask. The number one uh, response when we ask grizzled veterans, what would you have done differently looking back? is I would have done a better job with my past clients and center of influence. It would have made my life easier. I would have spent less money on marketing and things like that. So don't make that mistake. Start with your pop buys of people who you actually sold the house to. That leads into a very interesting question. So again, if you're thinking that door knocking and doing proactive lead generation, uh, you only have to do it until the point where you've got enough cash coming in, then you start buying your business. You just aren't listening. That is not really, that's not at all what we're saying. Your time is not, like some of you have gone through so many, uh, don't have enough, frankly, business experience to know the last thing you stop doing are the things that actually work to make you money. And that's exactly what so many of you do. You'll do the proactive lead generation, and then you'll come across some know-it-all that says, oh, you only do the proactive lead generation. Of course, they don't say it like that. They'll say, you only make cold calls, or they'll say something dumb like that until you've got enough business coming in. Then you start buying your business from Zillow. This is the asinine behavior and asinine type of level of advice that leads to so many agents failing. Once you have something that works, you never stop doing it. What you do is you get better at what it is that you're doing, and then you do more of it. When you get something, like one of the first things when someone comes to us as a coaching client, um, and let's say they're signing up for one of our one-on-one -on -one coaching programs. The, we teach our Harris certified coaches to not be judgy about where they're getting their business. We ask you, where did your last you know, transactions come from? And you'll send us a list of where your transactions came from. And then we'll say, like, you know, in other words, here are the addresses. What was the source of the business? And then what we always ask all of you to do is then identify what is there another source of the business? Because sometimes what agents will do is they'll say, well, I got that lead from Facebook. No, you didn't. You didn't get that lead from Facebook. You got that lead from a past client who said, use Bob. And then that seller couldn't find you online or didn't have your phone number. And they found you on Facebook. You get a message through Facebook and you then assume the lead came through Facebook. It didn't. It came from a referral from a center of influence past client. Facebook was essentially just the right. medium in which they found you. It'd be like saying, I got a lead from my voicemail. Exactly. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. So really, guys, what a lot of you are going to do, if you are smart, is you're going to never stop doing what works. Just make it so you're doing it at a higher level. Anything that's going to put a buffer between you and the prospective client in a market like this is to be avoided. I want to say that again, anything digital, paper, billboards, you know, doesn't matter. Anything that's going to be uh, between you talking directly with a prospective client, either face to face or over the phone is a mistake in this market. It's oversaturated. Every agent which, of which there's 1.7 million members of the National Association of Realtors, all of them come into the business not knowing how to do proactive lead generation. All of them have succumbed to buying business and branding and all of that. So all of them are communicating with everyone digitally because they don't know how to do it proactively. The people selling them the passive lead generation stuff have usually never sold real estate before. They themselves don't know how to pro do proactive lead generation. So they're going to tell you to buy an expensive CRM and drip on them, right? Isn't that what all of you are experiencing? If everybody else is doing that, don't do it. When everyone else is going in a certain direction, you can see off into the horizon, the direction is off a cliff. Here's an idea. Don't go in that direction. Do the opposite of what other people are doing, and you'll experience the opposite of what other people are experiencing. Most people fail in real estate. Most people fail at an accelerated rate in real estate during a time like this. Don't do what they're doing. Learn to be a proactive lead generator. That's right. So let's talk for a second about how to get better, how to hone your skills once you're in this habit. So usually agents will go through stages assuming they stick to it and don't give up. Assuming they last. Assuming they last long enough to stick to it. So for example, the first time you go out door knocking will probably be in your own neighborhood because you have some confidence about that. Maybe you've been watching the comparables and things like that. And you'll be pretty nervous about it. Maybe you'll stumble on your words. Maybe you'll only have the courage to go to five doors. Okay, so that's your beginning experience. But then you come home and you go to our Harris Certified Coach session, say that day, and you share your experience and you, you say something like, you know what, it wasn't that bad. 
I lived through it. It was okay. I finally went door knocking. But Julie, I'm worried about door knocking because I'm worried about being assaulted. Or, uh, you know, I'm worried about somebody trying to rape me. Or I'm worried about something else happening. Well, here's an idea. If you're thinking about door knocking in a neighborhood where personal safety is a concern, don't door knock in that neighborhood. Refer to point number one. <laughs> Choose wisely. Exactly. Okay. So go to an area. Like, for example, when Julie and I started selling real estate, we sold in a very nice neighborhood. Nothing wrong with it. We have a lot of rental properties called Clintonville, Ohio. And an area specifically called Beachwald. And the average sale price was low and there was a lot of sales velocity. Our first year in the business, we sold over 100 homes. Um, now, what we decided to do is we wanted to go to an area where the average sale price was something like, I don't know, eight times as much of what we were selling in our little starter home, mostly neighborhood. And we did. But the way we did it is the exact way we're telling you guys to do it now. For at least a year, maybe two years prior to actually starting to market in that community, we would go out and we'd get to know the community. We would go on walks on their walking trails. We would door knock in some cases. We would talk to the neighbors. We actually became um, you know, essentially part of that community, and then we moved there after we could actually afford it. And that was basically on Julie's 30th birthday, by the way. That's right. And so the point is we're starting to talk about how to improve prove, excuse me, how to hone your skills as you get better and better at it. And you just gave them a great example of that. We started out with, you know, starter homes, first time buyer stuff that was not that expensive, but we built a lot of skill doing that. And then we had that epiphany, hey, you know what, if we're going to be doing this kind of thing anyway, maybe we ought to raise our average sale price. But along with that came the confidence to do that, have more in-depth conversations, be more comfortable closing, asking for business door knocking expired, you know, your skills expand as long as you're taking action. And I have this conversation a lot with the coaches and they do with well, coaching well, clients that the conversations you have when you're in action are different than staying in in action, getting ready to get started and thinking about it. Here's the problem that most agents will have because they're geographic farming, which there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but because you guys have invested in a particular community, if that community is no longer an appropriate fit for, frankly, your your potential, your aspirations. You don't even want to live there anymore. Maybe it is someplace that's unsafe. You started there, but you don't want to go there. But all of your leads are coming from passive lead generation. You know, here and there, you'll get an occasional call or an opportunity because you don't have any real skills. You're just an order taking, hoping and praying that you get a lead from some source. Oh, I got a zip code from Zillow. I'm getting all my buyer leads from this particular area. You don't have any skill, which means you have nothing you can take with you. There's nothing that's transferable because you have not learned how to proactively lead generate. The reason that Julie and I were able to go from that first time home buyer market area to this really expensive market where we knew nobody had no personal professional contact clear across town. The reason we were able to do that was because we had the skill that we had sharpened those skills working with normal buyers and sellers. And that skill set working on those first time home buyer sellers, you know, for sale by owners and what have you and the expires and what have you was exactly the same skill set and scripts we use when working for with very multi-million dollar properties. We did it. You can do it too. But I'll give you a suggestion. Don't do what we did. Start in a more expensive <laughs> area and not have to then migrate well, to another. That, they, they don't have a choice thanks to any, inflation. I know, right? <laughs> right? There are no. Really, I know. E even some sketch neighborhoods are going for, you know. If you guys want to know who the best agents are in the country, I promise you it's not some big ego agent in San Diego whose average sale price is $1.5 who sells 30 houses a year and, and walks around like a peacock. No, that is not the best agent in the United States, not even flipping close. The best agents in the United States are the ones like Chuck Williamson and others of these agents that are in you know, parts of the world you guys, you know, United States, you guys have never heard of. Some of you will call them flyover states, but they have a low average sale prices, 200,000 or less, and some of them even 150,000 or less. In order for them to make the amount of money they want to make, they have to sell hundreds of homes per year. Those are the best agents in the United States, for sure. Average sale price spoils a lot of you into thinking that you're better at this, you know, essentially at this business than you are because you make so much money per transaction. If I were to take Chuck Williamson, for example, and I were to drop him in San Diego, California, where his average sale price would be probably, I don't even know, 30x what it is yeah. in North Carolina, you would discover quickly that Chuck would be the number one agent in that marketplace because he knows how to act. Probably he has the skills. Instantly. And by the way, I had to, a couple years ago, and Chuck listens to this podcast, so Chuck, I'm not making fun of you. I'm just sharing a story with the tens of thousands of people that are listening. I had to show him how to use Facebook. He absolutely, and he's not, he's younger than me. He absolutely has no connection to social media. 
his business is made uh, and his millions have been earned by being a proactive lead generator. Be like Chuck, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good mantra. And and by the way, that's the same reason why he's a really killer net at the end of the oh, year. Oh, yeah. You know, that's amazing. And I, a lot well, of our coaching clients that. that. Yeah. Chuck, Chuck will make maybe $3 million. And of that, because he doesn't buy his business, Chuck will keep, oh, maybe $3 million. Yeah. He has one and a half assistants. He doesn't do any marketing and branding. He doesn't do any TikTok videos. Matter of fact, I didn't even know what Chuck looked like after personally coaching him for years <laughs> until I saw his picture on, I don't even remember where, like a, a realtor.com page or something. I, you know, he doesn't market. He doesn't have to. He doesn't need it though. He know, and the best agents in the country, Greg Newman in San Diego, for example, proactive lead generator. There was a guy named, uh, who's a guy in Philadelphia that everyone who is a legendary Don something, right? I forget well, who. The second. best agents in the country are the ones that you haven't heard of because they keep their heads down. They keep their egos out of it. They focus on being of service to other people and they're proactive lead generators. That is a fact, Jack. Now you can sell a lot of houses. You could do a lot of volume. You can peacock around the world and everyone will think you, you know, you've essentially, you get a golden ticket every single day that you wake up. You guys get the inference there. But the reality of it is, is that your net sucks. And it's in a market like this where you're going to discover that's true. So guys, listen, do not wait to find out what we're telling you is true. Take actions, put yourself in a position where you can thrive in this market. We strongly encourage all of you who are considering a new broker to consider joining with Julie and I at eXp Realty. Just text the letters EXP to 512-758-0206. Look, that's my actual cell phone number. Open up a text right now if you're looking for a different brokerage situation. And just text EXP to 512-758-0206 and let's start the conversation. Some of you are right now ready to join EXP. Maybe you're new agents and you're wondering if it's a perfect fit for you. Of course it is. And I'll let you know how. If you're an experienced agent and you're looking for a, to move over to someplace where, frankly, it's the most proactive agent-centric brokerage we've ever come across, thus the reason we aligned with them, text me directly. If you're an experienced grizzled veteran agent or a broker and you don't want to become any broker from being a broker, mm -hmm. sorry for the bad joke, let's talk about eXp Realty. Text me directly, 512-758-0206. You guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.